Hi everyone and welcome. I hope you had a really good holiday. I'm trying to work out why my little man is moving. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, say hi, say hello in the chat. Nice to see you all. Be good to know who's here. Uh, so I hope you've had a really uh, lovely holiday. I hope that um, I hope you've enjoyed the sunshine. It's been absolutely gorgeous, hasn't it? So uh, yeah, and it's been uh, very hot to be doing school work today. So we've got 17 people in, which is great. Please say hello in the comments so we can see who's there. Hi, Adam. Hi, Lizette. Hi, Erin. Hi, Katie. Hi, Aditya. Uh, hi, Daisy. Hello, Miss Brennan. It's lovely to see you um, or to hear you or to see you writing something down. Hello, Rachel C. Uh, hello, Gabe. Oh, C. Doogie. No, that's... Oh, and Connor is C. Doogie, of course. And uh, Grace, well, it's nice to see you all. That's Grace, isn't it? And Mr. Ledbitter, hola. Right, so here we are. We've got a lot to cover today. I reckon 32 minutes. Not that I've uh, overplanned this at all. So let's see, let's see what we're going to get done today. Today's all about um, lines and about how you can use lines to improve your uh, photography. So uh, the language fact for the day, it was like a bit of a language fact. And the one today is it's a word uh, aperture, which is from the Latin aperire, which means to open. And it means a hole or an opening in English. Um, and that's useful for us as photographers because aperture is the opening in the lens through which light travels. And you can dictate how, how wide you open that hole. And that can have an impact on your images. So as some of you will have figured out now, there are two ways of controlling the light going to a camera. You've got the shutter and you've got aperture. We can talk about ISO another day, but in terms of light, it's aperture and it's shutter speed. So that's the language fact for the day. So let's get on and look, see what's on the menu in today's episode. We're going to start as ever with your brilliant photos, and then we're going to look at a masterpiece. And this week we're going to have a look at Annie Leibovitz, who's a very famous American portrait photographer, a lightning quiz. And then we've got the first of our technical sessions looking at lines, uh, vertical and horizontal lines. A bit more competition, a few more questions. Um, and then we're going to go and have a look at technique and think about diagonals and curves and how you can use them and think of them as the adjectives that help you to describe your subject. So let's crack on uh, with the first part of that and let's have a look at your brilliant photos. Well, let's uh, embarrass Mr. Ledbitter straight away. Um, I thought this was a cracking picture. Your challenge last week was to do some motion blur. And look at this, absolutely fantastic. Um, and I believe that Mr. Ledbetter was holding this camera in his right hand. Um, some, fab some fabulous motion blur there, almost cartoon-like on the right-hand side as the foliage is rushing past him. I think that is an absolutely brilliant photo. And all the more impressive for his face being sharp because hand-holding a camera whilst you're trying not to get knocked off your bicycle um, and getting the angle right is a challenge. So that was a really good effort, Mr. Ledbitter. Well done. <clears throat> we go on from there to Grace. And Grace produced this wonderful image. I thought this was the moon, first of all, but actually it's a, it's a light uh, that she has and she's holding it uh, just, just at the end of her fingertips. I love the way you've got that lovely glow coming off the light. And I think that the way that the, uh, the frame falls into darkness on the right hand side is absolutely everyone know. So, so don't try cycling one handed and taking pictures of yourself. because Obviously, that would be a, an awful way to uh, go to A&E and they're quite busy right now. <clears throat> so that's Grace. Fabulous photo and welcome. And that's a really, a really good image to put there for us to see. I thought Rachel produced some amazing pictures. If you've been looking at Flickr, she had three or four really stunning pictures. And I'm going to embarrass you, Rachel, and I'm going to show you show all of these, um, but not all in one go. I would be curious, Rachel, to know what shutter speed you were using when you shot this one and what it was you were waving up and down. I noticed that you were getting different um, different letters, possibly. I could see an S in this one and an A in another one. Maybe I've just stared at it for too long, but I thought this was really wonderful sort of abstract art, which is produced by having a slow shutter speed and painting with light in front of it. So I thought that was an absolutely brilliant effort. Sharjeev, as ever, has produced a simply stunning photograph of a rose, an orange rose this time. I think the texture is absolutely fabulous. Those deep, vibrant colours. And I think also uh, what works really well here is that first of all it is tack sharp it is a fabulously looking sharp image but that out of focus part behind it uh, that second rose it really adds to the image because sometimes the blurry bit can be quite unpleasant to look at and sometimes it can be very nice to look at but we'll get to more of that a bit later on 
So this is Katie, who uh, I was wondering what this was, first of all, and it's a kind of cat rug type thing, and it's got a bouncy thing on a spring on the end of it. I think it's a ball of some kind. So I thought I would try to keep your cat company with this little cat here. Uh, here's one I found earlier, and then perhaps we could also introduce a, uh, a dog, because there's always room for dogs uh, whenever we do these broadcasts. And that is my dog, that is Roxy, and the only way she would sit still is by eating things. But I'm going to tell you why she's chasing the cat. She's not the brightest animal in the world, to be perfectly honest with you. So now we have this photo. You will see more of this photo later on. This is Sharjeev's phone flash, again, working really well with the challenge that you were given. And this is a, uh, a mobile phone which is being waved at great speed. Hopefully it made it through intact and produced some fabulous motion blur, not to mention the great motion blur that you got with your, uh, with your arms there. So really, really good shot. Uh, second one from Rachel, casting spells this time. And uh, what I love about this is that we can see where it starts, and like a wavelength, it gets ever bigger as it moves from left to right along the page. What a cracking shot that is. I love this one from Erin, caught in the rain. I thought what was really interesting was that, first of all, you've got the front of the bicycle in this image. Without that, it would be, it somehow wouldn't make sense, but the context is completely made by having that bicycle at the front of the image. And therefore, we understand, we, we, we're put there, we understand that you're on the saddle, it's raining, you've got the road stretching away, curving off the left-hand side. Um, I love the muted colours produced and the shine produced by that uh, fresh rain. What a great shot that is, and a nice bit of motion blur on the road there in front of you. So I thought that was a very good shot. Daisy, this reminds me of Finding Nemo. I was thinking shoals of fish in the sea swimming around. Uh, absolutely cracking shot. Wonderful colours from uh, a fibre optic light. And it really is just a wonderful piece of abstract art. A sort of a perfect circle, or almost. Um, I think it looks absolutely great. What a fabulous shot that is. Grace, again, I love this because the reflections that you've got on the, uh, on the water and the clouds and the sun peeking through the top. And is that the moon or is that not the moon? I can see the left-hand side there. I couldn't quite decide what that was, but we can certainly see the sun peeking through. And I thought the blue filter worked really, really well here. So what a cracking shot that was. Another one from Rachel, I think almost the last one from you. The fact this looks like the infinity symbol works really well. And again, this looks like some kind of fiber optic light. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, it's a cat toy with a pom-pom. Oh, well, there we go, okay. So uh, that's that mystery solved. So Rachel, what are these lights you've got here? We're not quite sure, but it'd be great to know because uh, you produce some fantastic images with them. Erin's uh, second appearance with a frisbee, or if we're going to be, uh, if we're going to be accurate, an aerobie actually, and I know because I spent many hours looking for these things because they fly such an awfully long way. I thought the way that you that you changed the colours uh, worked really well here, almost inverted like some kind of colour negative. And I think that that abstract shape there works really well. You can see the motion blur, but actually I think it's just a lovely picture. So what else have we got? We've got uh, Aditya, who seems to have taken social distancing to a whole new level uh, via Vietnam. Ooh, and it's a good chance for me to, uh, to eat some humble pie about my geography last time. Wyoming is, as you said, Aditya, it's a state in the USA. It, it's, it's not in Canada. It never has been. So I, I go to the bottom of the class for that. But never mind. So I thought this was a great shot. The lovely curves uh, of, the, of the rock, the rock mass in front of us. And then your eye bounces around these different shapes. I think it looks absolutely wonderful. And Rhea driving into the sunset. Again, I thought this was very clever. A frame within a frame. You've got the sun setting in the distance behind the trees. And then you've got the context of that car. You've got the motion blur that you can clearly see on the door handles of the car. You guys produced some absolutely astonishing photos again. And I thought that was super impressive. What amazes me how each week these photographs get better and better and better. And this was Sharjeev, this time moving away from flowers to get some decent motion blur on water. Water is a really um, a really good subject to use for blur. So whether it's uh, a lake that you can use and get your phone really still and, and open the shutter for half a second, sorry, for, yes, for half a second, something like that, three quarters of a second, you get this sort of milky type effect, or that you can speed the shutter speed really high and then you can capture and capture each drop. So I think you've produced a really nice sort of dreamy um, effect there with your shot of the sea. Yeah, you know more than me about the USA, to be fair. That was a bit embarrassing. This one from uh, Grace. 
I love this. There's so much going on. And in fact, this image kind of takes us quite neatly towards where we're going today. And that's talking about lines. And the idea you've got those converging lines is what we call those, if you look top right and that line you've got leading away into the distance where everything seems to meet, this, this, this convergence that you get in photography because of the way that photographic lenses are constructed. You've got the blue of the water, the reflection of the water. You've got the horizontals, the verticals, the diagonals. It's a really busy picture and yet somehow it works really, really well. This, I think, I think this is my favourite photo you've taken of any kind of plants or flowers, Shahjeev. I love this. I think the colours are absolutely wonderful. And you can see how delicate those petals are and that deep, vibrant green that you get with the, uh, with the glow beautifully coming off the bud there. Um, very, very impressive. Uh, Adam, I know where you took this. This was, uh, this was the viaduct, wasn't it, in Balcom? And unlike me, you managed to climb into one of the arches to take this. Uh, I couldn't, wasn't quite tall enough to get up there, but you seem to get up there. I think this is really good. It's interesting, when I was here, I decided to crop in closer and to leave those two signs out, but actually, I think they add something to the image. It's a really, really good shot. Maybe I would go away and bring the exposure down a little bit and add a bit more contrast, and I think you might end up with a photo with a bit more pop there. But what I do like, and it's difficult to do from here, is that you have got that idea of the arches going away into infinity. I think it's a really, really, really lovely shot. So well done. That is all good. Still one more. We've got the fairy lights. This is the one I was talking about, Rachel, with this idea of, uh, of an A. Tell me that you were painting A's and I wasn't just imagining it. Um, or if you're not here, we'll just leave that in total silence. But I think that's absolutely fabulous. I think what also worked really well here is that you used half of the image and the rest of it just, just goes away into darkness. If the whole image was filled with this, uh, with these sort of highlights, I think it would be more difficult to look at. But I think the way that you've composed that works incredibly well. All right, so those are your images, all done and dusted. I had to rush to get through them because there are more every single week. I'm just going to be adding five or six slides each time. So please, 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 this week, try to get the same quality of images that you that you put in there. I've never known it. I, I, it was difficult to know what to leave out because you produced such great shots. So this week, we're looking at famous photographers and we're going to look at Annie Leibovitz. If you remember last time we looked at, uh, in fact we'll get to that later on, but we're going to looking at Annie Leibovitz this week and next week we're looking at Henri Cartier-Bresson. Now what I want to do is give you a little bit of information about uh, what Annie Leibovitz did. She's in her early 60s, she's a professional portrait photographer and she's best known for taking photos of celebrities. Um, and, and somehow revealing something about them. It's, it's a very difficult line of work because these people get photographed all the time and yet it's your job to go there and try to get something else. If anyone can recognize either of those two characters on the left-hand side, that would be an interesting pop quiz to see if you know who they are. Uh, one of them is still with us, one of them isn't. Uh, one of them is a very famous actor and one of them was a very famous singer. Um, now, she is best known as being the chief photographer of the Rolling Stone magazine. Now, Rolling Stone magazine is probably one of the best known. It is Meryl Streep. Well done, it did here. Uh, Rolling Stone is one of the best known uh, magazines, and it actually started in the early 70s. And, of course, she joined it at the, from, from the very start, and she was there as their chief photographer for 10 years. So she went off with the Rolling Stones on tour. She's well known for uh, taking photographs of John Lennon. And, in fact, she's the last person, the last professional photographer who photographed John Lennon before his death. Um, she, there was some controversy when she photographed the Queen because one of the Queens, one of the people in the palace said that she had, uh, that, that the Queen and her had had an argument. It is Prince, well done, Mr. Lepizzi, you were first in there. Um, that the Queen and her had had a falling out and in fact it wasn't the case at all. Um, and it was really interesting reading about the process that she went through to take those photos in the palace because it was actually quite a difficult thing to do. And she said that in many ways being American made it a bit easier for her because she didn't quite have to kowtow <laughs> to, uh, you know, you did do well. Yeah, th there will be prizes. I shall get on to prizes uh, later on. I'd be happy if Erin uh, and Katie confirmed that... Um, I thought you were saying a gin. Uh, if Erin and Katie confirm they did get their prizes from uh, from last week, that would be great because they have hopefully found their way to your door your doorsteps by now. So yeah, she took some great photos of the Queen. The one I want to focus on today is, I guess, a different kind of photograph altogether, um, and it's one that uh, she was tasked with doing um, as part of Vanity Fair. 
I've got a pop quiz on the right hand side, which I think probably gives an unfair advantage to uh, Mr. Ledbetter and to Miss Brennan, because this is part of our history. You guys probably won't have come across many of these characters at all. But she was asked to go and take an image, uh, a documentary image of the of the most important people in the political world in the States. And this is who she shot. So I'll be interested to see how many people you can name. But I thought this was quite interesting, the story behind this. So this was for Vanity Fair magazine. And she was asked to go to the White House and to shoot this image. But usually when uh, people are invited to take shots in the White House, they they have to go and do it in the Oval Office. But this one wasn't taken in the Oval Office because uh, Andy Leibovitz had some experience of shooting images there and although the windows are very impressive, they tend to dominate the picture and it's very hard to control the light because so much light comes through them. And because you often don't know what time of day you're going to be actually shooting the images, it made it really hard to plan for it. So um, so this really was the, the who's who of American politics and I'll be curious to see how many of these uh, George Bush and some others that is true I would like you to answer that how old do you think I am mm, yeah we could answer that that'd be quite interesting how old do you think Miss Brennan is so uh, it's not not many answers coming coming through there so let's have a look at what the answers should have been for this you've got on the left hand side that's uh, Colin Powell sat beneath him is the vice president Dick Cheney then you've got George Bush George Bush, interestingly, last question there, he is from Texas. And one of the things that Annie Leibovitz says in her story about this image is that he had a real Texan swagger like a cowboy and that she didn't have to direct this image too much. She just said to, she asked George Bush to put his hands in his pockets um, and it pretty much came out like that. Now, the lady next to Bush on his left, that's Condoleezza Rice. She was the security advisor, a very formidable lady. And there's an interesting story between behind the guy who is standing with his head. You can see his head's on the portrait there. I don't know whether you can remember, but at the time of 9-11, when the second plane went into the Twin Towers, George Bush was on a trip at an elementary school and he was, uh, he was watching a class. And that guy there, whose name is George Tenet, he's the chief of staff. He was, he was the chief of staff at the time uh, for, the, for the White House. He was the one who whispered in... Uh, into uh, Bush's ear that the second plane hit the building. So that, that was his claim to fame. She didn't know he was coming in for this photo, so she had to hastily get the lighting sorted out to get George Tenet in there. And then you've got, uh, sorry, to get Andrew Card in there, not George Tenet. George Tenet is beneath Andrew Card. He's the head of the CIA. And then on the right-hand side, that formidable-looking guy is, uh, is Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of State. So there we go. It's interesting, a different type of image from the ones that we've seen before and one that sort of is, is almost a document of our time. But for those of us who were around at that time, that, that, that brings back certain memories of the war on terror and at a time when uh, this administration was really, was really entering its... Uh, was really swaggering around doing an awful lot of stuff uh, around the world. So, with the history lesson done, let's get on to the quiz and see how we do. We're going to do, I think, five questions. Miss Brennan, this is where your... Um, your Anything that you can do here to, 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 to capture the marks would be really well appreciated. So 10 marks for the first correct answer. This carries across, to, in fact, this is the second week, so we'll do the totals, totals at the end of this. Um, this is for adults and students, uh, so whoever, f fastest finger first, all that sort of thing. So without any further ado, I'm going to put the first slide up. Here we go. From which language does the word bokeh originate? Oh, we have a winner, and it is Catboy. I'm going to let this thing play out, because I've spent ages making uh, a lot of this. I've spent ages making this. It's a combination of, uh, of a cinema commercial and a scary sound. So there we go. It's the countdown timer with a difference. So the answer, bokeh, is Japanese. It was photographine that, uh, that actually came from Greece, uh, but uh, a good guess nonetheless. So I think that is Gabe. Uh, 27 bonus points for Grace. Okay, well, you're in charge of that. So let's go on to the second question. Uh, so Japanese is the answer. Here is question two. On your marks, get set, go. What does bokeh mean? What does bokeh mean? 
and I'll take an approximation here and look at it exactly right. Ooh, he's in again. Quality of blur. Stop the clock. That was very impressive. Quality of blur. So this is about 10,000 points to Gabe now. Um, so uh, let's all try and speed up slightly. Uh, it is the aesthetic quality of the blur of an image, which is what I was waffling on about. Well done, Lizette. Uh, we were looking at Sharjeev's image earlier of the uh, the orange rose and the fact that the quality of the blur behind it was actually very pleasing. So yes, you are two up, Gabe. Points are plenty. So let's go on to the next one, uh, which is this. Who shot this image? <laughs> The photographer, that's that that that's a fantastic answer. The landscape photographer dude, th this isn't cutting the ice, I'm afraid. A human, oh Ditya, th this is the same as your the difference between A and B was the one that's called A and one that's called B. The person from last week, yes. Well I have no answers there. That's shock horror. I've beaten you. It was Ansel Adams, my favourite photographer. There'll be five points any week for someone who says randomly Ansel Adams uh, because uh, he, I think, is the greatest landscape photographer of all time, in my humble opinion. So, next one. We describe light as having quality, colour and... Focus. Strength. Focus. Intensity. Oh, I'm loving pressing this button. Strength, I guess. It's a ditty. Let's do it again. Lizette, saturation. No. Well, good. I've beaten you twice. That's excellent news. So it's direction. Those were the three things. Contra, I am mean. I, it needs, needs to be done. I mean, come on, I've got the microphone and no one else can talk, so I've got to take advantage of this. Uh, so direction was the right answer there. We almost, uh, you almost did well. But uh, Gabe, I think, came shining out of that one. So that's the first quiz. We've got another, another quick quiz a bit later on. So let's jump into the technical bit. <clears throat> I want to make you aware, the stuff I'm going to show you now, it's not as though you, you, you're you taking an image, you're looking, looking through the viewfinder and you're, and you're necessarily looking for each of these different elements, but these are things that you should be aware of, because if you can tie these things together, it, it, it'll make your images look a bit better. So we're going to look at uh, horizontal and vertical lines, diagonal zigzags and curves, and think about these shapes as being adjectives that help to describe your subject and to add meaning to it and when you are composing try to look for these basic shapes and if you can put them in the right place it will always improve your image. So let's go on and have a look at horizontal lines. When the human eye naturally works in a horizontal way you scan from side to side when you look at things. Yes you look, you look things up and down but eyes form horizontal lines with adjacent objects. So if you're looking at objects that are, that are the same uh, in, in the same plane, in the same distance apart, your eyes will form lines between them anyway. We're used to horizontals. Horizontals like the horizon. Horizontals like buildings. Now in photographic or art terms, when you introduce horizontal lines into your work, into your images, you get this sense of calmness, peacefulness, rest, tranquility, stability and so on. So that's the sort of that's the sort of feeling that gets conjured up by using horizontals in your in your work. However, that last point that I'm trying to make is that this is only when if all you're doing in your image is putting in lines, that's what you should get. If your subject is something that's much bolder than the lines around it, then then you will get less of a sense of calm and peacefulness. But that's what horizontal lines can bring to your image. OK, so pop quiz. Uh, I know Miss Brennan knows this because uh, we, we actually stumbled upon each other in this place at the same time, uh, which was very bizarre. Um, but the question is, who lives there? Why am I showing you this picture? Are there horizontal lines? Where are they? And thinking about away from photography for a second, looking at this, uh, this room, 
what do the horizontal lines, if they exist in this room, tell us about the person that lives there? So anyone uh, like to hazard a guess on whose room this is? I'm thinking a TV series that some of you may have watched. It, it is OK. It's, it's all coming through. It is Ross from Friends. OK, so the next question is, why am I showing you this? Well, because I was scanning through all my pictures to find images that I had of horizontal lines and I hadn't. Uh, it's a man. Um, I hadn't actually figured this out before. But this I mean, I've drawn in some of the horizontal lines. They're everywhere in this room. And you might say, well, look, there are horizontal lines in, in every room. Yes. Yes, they are. But if you look at the way that this room is designed, that's different from the uh, other characters in the series, um, it's for a reason, because it's Ross that lives here, and Ross is very much a control freak. He likes everything neat and tidy. That's the sort of person that he is. And that's and, and in that way, his room has been arranged like a like a like a doctor's waiting room. It's all it's all angle, it's all straight lines that, that you get there. So it's quite interesting how in designing um, a, a set for a TV show, they also use this same idea about about the the importance, the meaning of horizontal lines. I thought that was quite interesting. So some more horizontal lines. This when I was in China and I looked up in the air and I saw some, uh, well, a washing, I'll say a washing line. It's a it's a washing array. But you can see to my uh, to my eyes, it looked like something weird and wonderful because we just don't have those in the UK. It's always interesting going somewhere that you're not familiar with and seeing things for the first time. Um, Let's look at vertical lines now. Uh, vertical lines, in the same way as horizontal lines, they align with the frame, with your photo frame. And vertical lines, if you're going to use vertical lines, they often sit better if you turn your camera on its side and go into portrait view. And when you've got vertical lines that are sat in the ground, they often give the impression of, of gravity or of flowing. You get a sense of speed. Uh, depending upon where you place them, they can form a bit of a challenge or an obstacle to the viewer and they can be used to give a sense of power. Um, of course, you won't get all of these things each time, but it's, it, it, it's worth bearing in mind. This is, this is another sort of adjective that you can use when you're trying to, uh, trying to compose your picture. Um, vertical lines are always compared by the viewer to the edge of the frame, because the edge of the frame is straight. So when you see a vertical line, you will, in, you will, you will instinctively look to see how it compares to the straight line of the side of the frame. And you can work um, with horizontals and verticals to try to give your image a sense of equilibrium. So this one image uh, I took a few years ago, I like the fact it ended up looking like barcodes. So again, just a series of verticals, but it just it just worked quite well. It's an image that I think pops. Um, this one that I took of the cadets probably five or six years ago. And this is the sense of the vertical line being implied. There is no vertical line, but actually this image is held completely together by this line that is implied in the centre of the picture. It's not there, but it is there because, because it's, it, it's there because of contrast, because it's a, it's a much brighter colour, or, or a darker colour, it doesn't matter, but it's a different colour and it's a vertical that just rises steadily through the frame. So that sense of implied lines can work really well. So this is Brighton, the old pier, um, and this is the remnants of uh, one of the parts of the pier that got ripped away years and years ago. And you can see you've got these posts which are stumps sticking out of the ground. And it gives you this sense of, of unfinished, of gravity, that they're sinking downwards. Because, of course, you know, gravity is real and we expect things to fall. So there's a sense of expectation when you put vertical lines into an image. Uh, and there we are. I mean, there are plenty in this, uh, in this photo. All right, so that's the first phase done, and we're going to look at some more um, shapes a little bit later on. The next part is the quiz. Now, I, I hope you've all warmed yourselves up. Uh, Ross Geller, yeah, if you'd spelt Geller right, Lizette, I think we'd have a bit more time for you there, but uh, there's a definitely too many E's, too many R's there, but, uh, but I like the sentiment. So we're now going to go and do the second part of the quiz. Uh, I would like you to be slightly quicker than you were last time, unless your name's Gabe. So here's the first question. Which term is used to describe turning the camera to follow a subject? No, no capital I I spot it as well. Very poor. Tracking. Mm. Panoramic. Mm. It's 
kind of right, but I want to pass my dog and the tracking. Oh, this is my favourite sound. I hate the sound of you doing well. This is this is good. No, no, okay, well, never mind. So it's a pan. We looked at panning last week, okay? Tracking something slightly different. Panning is what we did last week. You pan the camera around to create panning. Yet yeah, it's no good saying it after I've given the answer. <coughs> honestly. Um, so panning, that was the answer we were looking for there. Um, and you had done so well up until this week as well. So here's the next one. I, I, well, let's see how this one goes. Which mechanism dictates the length of time that light is allowed to hit the image sensor? Which mechanism dictates the length of time? <laughs> Maybe you did do it before. I apologise. We're almost there, as you say. Oh, OK, that was Mr Ledbetter straight in there. With, uh, with, with Gabe in second place. It is the shutter. So let's, let's turn this thing off. It is the shutter. So it's shutter speed or shutter. That's what I was looking for there, which is impressive because actually, although we're, we're doing some, some fairly general stuff, the notion of shutter speed and aperture is actually really important if you want to go on and take better pictures because understanding that bit of science will really help you later on. So it is a shutter which opens and closes and it, it's actually a lot like a curtain in that it moves across and there's a gap in it and you can dictate how long that's open for and therefore how much light is allowed to go into the camera. So that was shutter speed. We have one more. What is the name of the increments in which you increase or decrease shutter speed? So you know when you do clicks to increase or decrease it, you might say I'm reducing the shutter speed by two. Seconds, <coughs> milliseconds, oh, let me think about that. <coughs> no, it begins with an S and it's the opposite of star. Tomatoes, ah, oh. <coughs> it's not two tomatoes. Nano, so it is a stop, and it's Gabe again. Well done. <laughs> oh, everyone's going to love you. Uh, so it is two stops. That's what it's called. So when you when you reduce the shutter speed by two clicks on a camera, it's a bad way of describing it. But they're called stops. Okay, that's what they're known as. Uh, so that's the end of the quiz, and uh, I think maybe you need to do a bit of revision before we uh, before we all meet again. So let's have a look at diagonal lines. I'm going to jump onto this next part, um, and then we've got the competition. Um, so diagonal lines. Diagonal lines, as we've established before, they're a good way of introducing tension and a dynamic element to your image. Um, you've got a big choice of angles when you put diagonals in, um, unlike vertical and horizontal lines where they're vertical or horizontal, obviously. They help to give the idea of speed and movement, and there's this idea of unfinished or unresolved that we've talked about before, the same as the verticals. But also, diagonals give that sense of depth and distance. When you think about your shooting a building, and you can see it moving away into the distance where all the lines converge, that's that sense of depth that you get by the lines coming together at the horizon. And parallel lines tend to give, parallel diagonals give a sense of, of energy. So let's look at a few so you can find them. Um, and this might be danger in case uh, she's gonna fall off this climbing frame, but you can see you've got lots of diagonals uh, and some horizontals as well, to be fair. But uh, that mishmash tends to work quite well and gives the image uh, a sense of interest that it just wouldn't have otherwise. This one, we could argue, is a triangle too. This is Seven Sisters. But you can see that your eye will very quickly have drawn a two sides and probably the third side of this triangle as well. And of course, it helps to lead your eye around the image. Because when you looked at this, you'll probably have gone up the green slope and down uh, the white cliffs on the other side, the chalk cliffs. And there are always some buffoon standing right at the edge, um, which is ridiculously dangerous. So let's go on to curved lines, sense of flow, movement and acceleration, smoothness and elegance and grace. And if you think back to golden section that we looked at, we know that this works really well as a compositional technique. It can also control how the viewer looks at the image or the order in which the viewer looks at the image. But it can be quite difficult to put curves into your images. So let's look at a few examples. This one was right next to Seven Sisters. And what made this image interesting were the curves that you can see there. And obviously you've got you've got the diagonals as well. But that curve somehow brought the image together really well. 
Uh, this one, more obviously so, your, your eyes are taken right down into the depths uh, of this building, um, like so, sort of spiralling down like a spiral staircase. And then you've got, this one was in Lewis, I think, and you've got, again, get a bit like Erin's picture we saw earlier on the bicycle, where your eyes are taken round the corner and you've got various different curved lines taking us um, through the image and telling us where to look. So the last one, compositionally, compositionally, are triangles. Dynamic diagonals and stable verticals in one shape. So all of that in one, two for the price of one, Triangles appeal to the human eye as a strong, sh it's a strong shape. It's easy to construct in photographic terms. And if you build two sides of the triangle, as we saw with that picture of the cliff a minute ago, the human eye will draw the third side in. And the lines often converge, they come together to help form triangles in terms of buildings. Um, and you can choose whether to, have a, whether to have a stable triangle with a solid base or an unstable triangle. And you get a different feeling from the image depending on what you do. So here's one that I took at the Ace Cafe reunion in Brighton. You get thousands of bikers down there in one of the early weeks of September. And when you look at this, did you see the triangle? And that's what the human eye tends to draw um, when, when there is the opportunity for it to pick the different points and to put the shapes together to make a triangle. This image interested me because I was, uh, this was at Pride, I think, year before last. And they were, I, I was taking pictures, this was the Ford float going past, and I got pictures of various different people, and I got pictures of this woman in various different poses, but then this one stood out, and I couldn't quite work out why that was the one that I kept coming back to. And that was why, because that triangle was just, it just gave the image a little bit more interest. I can't claim to have planned that, that's what she did, and I got a picture of it, but it, it was the one that in thumbnail form just stood out beyond all the others that I had of the people going past. So that is the, that's the technical bit for today, all right? Quite a lot of listening there, so well done. Uh, this, by the way, is the, uh, is the solution to last week's uh, puzzle, the Spot the Difference competition. I thought that I had been spectacularly mean, um, but obviously I wasn't being mean enough because I, I thought it would be impossible to find some of these, uh, especially the star halfway down the street, the fact I had changed the... Uh, the number on the Halifax building. I put the Hazelwick crest on one of the uh, cash machines. And if you look at the sign, I had changed it for whatever it said there to Hazelwick School, but they all got spotted, which was really frustrating for me. Um, and uh, I, I mean, obviously, uh, well done, Katie. That was absolutely fantastic. What a star you are. It, I'm gonna be honest, it slightly annoys me that you solved the puzzle in less than half the time it took me to make it, but hey, it's taught me that being a puzzle maker is not gonna be my uh, my future life, but well done. There'll be a prize weaving its way to you, and the uh, on the grid, it's spelt out photo interpretations, that 20 letter word that we all use at least three times every day. So well done. Um, which takes us on to this week's competition, and this is another spot the difference, I'm a glutton for punishment, they are my favourite sort of competitions. So I'm going to give you 90 seconds, and this is where, Miss Brennan, you're going to have to make a note of uh, who gets them right. I'll let you know who picks out the right answers. So I'm going to give you 90 seconds to uh, get as many correct as you can, and then uh, I'll roll it out for the competition for the rest of the week. On your marks, get set, go. <laughs> One for Mr. Ledbetter, that's one for Katie. Katie got ahead of uh, Daisy just there. Speck of Light by Tree Gabe, yes. Tree has gone, Katie, yes. Missing Plant, Lizette, yes. Nine and six already spotted. The White Pole, that's one for Aditya. House number, that's spotted. Cat on Roof. Yeah, it's actually the ADT thing, so you, you, you get something for that. Light in tree, yes. Black bit in corner. Yes, that's true. I think that was actually uh, Shaji. Or his trousers. A plant is missing. Shiny thing missing above tree, yes. It is the leg, yeah, we've got that already. The alarm, yes, that's what it was. 
the pot plant we've got, security cameras, security box, yes. Alarm gone from war, 15 more seconds. A missing doorknob, yeah, it, it is a missing doorknob, it's actually a, uh, a buzzer, a bell. Numbers on bin, well spotted, that is good. The ivy is missing, Daisy. Yes, it is missing. Well spotted. That was in the bin. Just picked that by uh, Katie, I'm afraid, Adam. Five seconds. Okay, well, that was uh, all very, very impressive. You did spot quite a large number of those, I have to say. Uh, weird yellow rod on fence. Yes, that was one of the streaks of light, I think. So that's well spotted too. So we will total those up and give you the uh, the winners of the of the uh, competition over two weeks. We had the door number, I think, before there, Connor. You guys are much better at this than I. You get through it so quickly. So um, you can see, same thing. I'm going to put this onto uh, the Hazelwick Yellow page of Google Classroom in what seems to be finished here. And please email your answers to head of year nine at hazelwick.org.uk. What we're going to do is pick the winners out of a hat this time. So uh, you've got a whole week to do this. Get your answers in. This will spell a 20 letter word. Um, and this one I think you'd use even less often than photo interpretations. Uh, but get your answers in to head of year nine at hazelwick.org. And we'll pick the winners um, in next week's uh, in next week's live stream. So that brings us very, very neatly to the end of today's episode, 42 minutes. I've gone on slightly longer than I wanted to, but well done for sticking with it. Um, we have Katie in first place with five differences and Lizette in second. That is very impressive. We'll total all that up. Uh, Anti-disattachmentarism. I think that's more than 20 words, 20 letters, isn't it? I can't get through counting it now. So th the challenge this week, guys, is perfectly obvious. All the stuff that you've learned today, um, try to use these lines to build your images but whatever else you do take photographs this week please get them up onto Flickr because you have produced some amazing images and it's a it's a genuine pleasure to look through absolutely everything that you've done I will put this um, this video cast whatever it is video onto uh, YouTube as soon as we finished um, and in the meantime thank you so much for coming I have a fabulous week ahead of you um, and I look forward to uh, seeing you all again this time next week. Uh, Miss Brennan and Mr Ledbetter, thank you very much for continuing to support this. I don't know what I'd do without you counting and without you winning and getting all the questions right, Mr Ledbetter. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'll see you in exactly a week's time, guys. Bye-bye. See you all later.